I'm, I'm assuming that. Oh. Yes, yes, this is fine. fine. I'm I'm a, a okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Elisa, and uh, thank you, Dominique, for inviting me. I'm I'm honored to be the first in this uh, series, which looks like a fantastic series. So I'm looking forward to to the coming talks. Um, and um, just as a little bit of background, the talk I'm going to give uh, today is coming out of a book. Um, Elisa mentioned that I'm I'm looking at uh, uh, working on a, a book project. Um, I had initially thought it would span from the third millennium into the first millennium, but of course, as you all know, once you start digging into things, um, it becomes narrower and narrower. Um, and so it's really focusing on the, the end of the third millennium. So, so I'm, I'm getting to the third millennium, having done the second and the first millennium in my previous two books. Um, so uh, what I'm presenting today is one sort of part of this larger project, which is actually looking at the or three reception of the Akkadian period, um, which I don't address in today's talk, but this is nevertheless important for that. Um, so hopefully that will uh, see the light of day at some point um, in the near future. Okay, let me see how to move forward. I've, there we go. Um, I feel like we we're all already getting out of practice with Zoom. So Akkadian art, both large scale monuments and small scale seals has been celebrated in modern scholarship for its aesthetic qualities, which align closely with those of modern audiences. For example, the monumental stele of a victorious Naram Sin on a mountainside seen on the left is considered a masterpiece on account of its coherent composition, depiction of landscape elements and seductively modeled human figures. In particular, the term naturalistic has been invoked, especially in opposition to art from the preceding early dynastic periods, which is typically characterized as conceptual or abstract. The term naturalistic is, however, highly problematic and vague in its application, but the concept continues to be invoked in discussions of Akkadian art and is arguably the most common characterization of the period's artistic output along with the related concept of realism. This approbation of Akkadian naturalism has been tempered by acknowledgement of concurrent formal qualities that remain stubbornly non-naturalistic. What Melissa Eppheimer in her discussion of the modern reception of Naramsen Steely has described as troubling to early scholars because of the co-occurrence of what was seen as both, quote, fantastical yet real stylized yet naturalistic, end quote. Nonetheless, a dominant art historical paradigm structured around naturalism continues to inflect interpretations of Akkadian art, which I would suggest blinker us to what the formal elements of the individual works are actually doing. The Akkadian state was established under the first ruler of its dynasty, Sargon, sometime around 2350 BCE, when he claimed rulership of all of Southern Mesopotamia. As far as we are aware, this was the first time that a king had successfully brought under single rule all the various independent city-states that made up the regions known as Sumer in the south and Akkad to the north in central Mesopotamia. Sargon himself seems to have come out of the court of the king of Kish, and it appears that he built a newly founded capital called Agade, the capital remains unexcavated and its precise location is debated. Our knowledge of this period is shaky due in part to the absence of the capital city, but also paradoxically because the Akkadian state and especially two of its rulers, Sargon and his grandson Naram Sin, lived on in the cultural memory of Mesopotamia through the end of the first millennium BCE. Later legends mythologized the deeds of these kings both endowing them with heroic status and cursing them for hubris and transgressions. Their monumental statues and steles continued to be maintained in temple courtyards for hundreds of years. And in fact, our best preserved examples, including the victory stele of Naram Sin, were excavated not from Mesopotamia, but from the city of Susa in southwestern Iran, 
where they were taken as booty by an Elamite ruler, Shutruk Nahunta, in the 12th century BCE, about 1,000 years after their original production. For many modern scholars, the association of naturalism with heroism and imperialism makes sense and has gone unquestioned. It has seemed self-evident that the first great territorial state should embrace a Renaissance-like love of the natural world and strive to reproduce it in their art. The many elements of the art that defy interpretation as naturalistic, for example, the regularized pattern of the curls of the beard and the geometric shape of the eyebrows seen on a life-size copper head of an Akkadian ruler, have been attributed to the period's extreme antiquity and its so-called oriental origin. Today, I would like to challenge the interpretation of Akkadian art as naturalistic. Indeed, I find the term vague and unsatisfactory. More impressionistic than an accurate analysis of the visual forms and material properties of the artwork themselves. By looking closely at the monuments and by precisely enumerating their visual and formal components, I propose that we can understand those elements that appear naturalistic to be doing something beyond imitation of perceived reality. They are, in fact, enacting a materiality of charisma. And moreover, it is a very specific materiality of bodies and textiles. Several scholars have proposed related interpretations in which the material presence expressed in the artworks is connected to the concentration of power in the single figure of the king. Here, I would like to push this idea further and suggest that this charisma of materiality endowed the Akkadian monuments with a force, one might call it an aura, that actually helped to propel the memory of the Akkadian rulers. In other words, these monuments don't just reflect or document an interest in the physical world on the part of the Akkadian kings, they actively contributed to the manifestation of those rulers' heroic or even divine character. Over the course of this talk, I will break down the formal features that contribute to an aesthetic sense of both naturalism and stylization, the real and the fantastic, and argue that the concept of naturalism obscures a more precise understanding of the features, which exhibit an overwhelming and pointed emphasis on the material presence of very specific things, namely the physical body and textiles, the two being, in fact, intimately interconnected with one another. This materiality is achieved primarily through the volumetric rendering of musculature and other bodily parts, both human and non-human, and the tactile qualities of fabric. The bodies, however, are not depicted as occupying empirical space. They do not relate to one another in anything more than a schematic or diagrammatic fashion. Yet they make present the physical world as tactile, solid, durable, and immutable, aspects that I contend are critical for understanding both the initial motivation and continuing efficacy of the monuments. I argue that the material presencing affected through these works imbued them with a particular kind of aura of mytho-heroic nature, which in turn attracted and ensnared post-Acadian viewers providing visual and physical attestation to the literary legends. While many scholars assume a general impression of naturalism, some have probed the formal elements deeper in order to capture more specific qualities of expressiveness, in particular, that of concreteness. Writing in the 1950s, Henrietta Gronewegen Frankfurt, still one of the most perceptive analysts of Near Eastern art, identifies a sense of what she calls actuality in Akkadian art that she attributes to its, quote, peculiarly concrete, end quote, character. The rendering of two primary elements of Akkadian royal art contributes to this sense of actuality and concreteness and physical presence to which modern art historians have responded so well. These are bodily anatomy, both human and animal, and textiles. The two are interrelated in that the materiality of the textiles can be linked to the presencing of a human body. Nonetheless, the two elements do not produce naturalism or realism in a comprehensive fashion as understood in Western aesthetics. Instead, 
I argue that the artistic expression of what we today perceive as naturalism, the sense of which derives from the formal properties conveying concreteness, can be more accurately understood as the desire to manifest in material form very specific physical qualities and not others. And that these certain physical qualities such as musculature and textiles construct a singular visual and material world of charismatic heroic kingship in which divinely sanctioned authority emanates from human rulers who straddle the edge between the human and divine worlds. Much has already been written about the highly detailed depiction of musculature in both human and animal bodies during the Akkadian period. For example, Irene Winter's association of Naram Sin's sexually alluring body with his newly elevated status as a divine ruler. The body as a whole tends to be rendered with volume and mass in a novel manner. However, its material presence is felt particularly in the depiction of human musculature especially that of the legs and arms. This rendering of musculature, also seen on animal and composite figures, should be distinguished from poses and gestures, which tend to be hierarchical, almost diagrammatical in form. In other words, what conveys a sense of naturalism to contemporary viewers derives almost entirely from the volumes and masses of figural bodies, and not from their positions or interactions with one another in space. Indeed, despite the assertion by many scholars of unified or coherent space in Akkadian art, space operates primarily as a void in which the mass of individual figures concretely exist. This is the actuality described by Gronoveg and Frankfurt. Already in the carved reliefs of steely fragments of Sargon, such as the example I've been showing you, an interest in and emphasis on musculature is seen in the high relief and multiplanar modeling of the depicted human figures. Yet in analyzing the rendering of musculature across the reigns of multiple Akkadian rulers, it is evident that there was no single straight trajectory of artistic rendering following a path to greater naturalism. Rather, different approaches and techniques were employed. And in considering these, we might enumerate a more precise understanding of the purpose served by the physicality of the depicted musculature. For example, in the Sargon steles, musculature is defined through segmented and multiplanar geometries of form that come together as separately worked sections to form a whole such as a leg or arm. This can be seen, for example, in the legs of the figures shown on the stele fragment attributed to Sargon. It is particularly clear in the bent leg of the less most falling enemy on the upper register that I'm pointing to with the red arrow, where a series of incised lines articulate oval and teardrop shaped forms marking the calf muscle and ankle. Even when the different parts do not appear completely segmented, as in the ruler's left arm that is extended to hold a battle net, in a triangular fragment from the top of a stele, and I'm showing you four different views of it here, the muscles are given volume and mass through geometric forms and planes. And this is probably easiest seen in the leftmost uh, detail. The bulging muscle of the upper arm rises on its own plane and is delineated from a triangular depression that follows the bend of the arm, while another raised section below the depression follows the contour of the elbow the entirety consisting of a series of raised and depressed planes. A quite different technique for rendering musculature is seen in the monuments of Naram Sin, including his Susa stele, a second stele found in far Northern Mesopotamia at the site of Pir Hussein near Diyarbakir, Turkey that you see on the right, and a copper figure of a door guardian um, also found in northern Mesopotamia near the town of Basetki in northern Iraq uh, that I'll show you in a moment. In all of these, the human body is made physically present through high relief and three-dimensional sculpting that create a volumetric, smoothly rounded form. Unlike the segmented parts of arms and legs that are built up from different planes of relief seen in the Sargon steles, the human body of Naram Sin's monuments swells and bulges in rounded forms. This is especially evident in the Susa stele, 
in which musculature is more implied than articulated, but where the presence of the body is made materially present through the actual physical volume of the relief carved high above the background and undercut to produce shadows. Though usually set in opposition to the Sousa Steely's naturalism, Naramsin's Pierre Hussein Steely employs a similar use of high rounded relief, although with less undercutting. And just as Naramsin's buttock and thigh swell under the fabric of his kilt in the Sousa Steely, in the Pierre Hussein Steely, his muscular pectoral swells under the flowing tufts of the garment crossing his chest. The copper figure of the gate guardian known as Lahmu, or at least what has survived of the lower half of the figure, can be related to the high relief seen on the Pierre Hussein and Susa steles. The bare legs wrapped around the gate post lie solidly on the flat surface of the circular base, producing an effect of high relief with significant undercutting. Produced through the process of lost wax metalworking, the fluid character of molten metal is captured in the rounded swelling forms of the calf muscles, the soles of the feet, and the buttock. A group of well-executed -exec cylinder seals has been associated with the Acadian royal court through their inscriptions, which name officials who claim to be servants of the king and other members of the royal family. In 1977, Richard Zettler proposed that seals bearing these distinctive inscriptions acted as seals of office that were spowed, bestowed on an official by the king. While Akkadian seals as a whole display a range of carving skills, schematization and abstraction in their rendering, and small portable seals were used for a variety of administrative and amuletic purposes and were produced and used by a wide range of individuals, we can nonetheless take the so-called royal seals as part of the same visual and artistic tradition as the monumental sculptures discussed so far. The royal seals were carved deeply into the stone to produce exceptionally high relief in the impressions with an emphasis on volumetric musculature of the same intensity as found on the large scale royal monuments. Among these seals, contest scenes between heroes and upright animals predominate. Contest scenes have a long history in Mesopotamian art and are especially popular in the glyptic of the preceding early dynastic period. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a moment, where elaborate patterns of intertwining and overlapping upright um, contestants characterize the large majority of seal imagery. Yelena Rakic has identified four main compositional modes seen among the contest scenes of the Akkadian period the most distinctive of which she refers to as the two pair compositional group, a highly standardized composition of two balanced pairs of contestants, one of whom is usually the nude hero with six curls or the Mahmoud. Um, and I've been showing you some examples of these, um, including this one. Although not exclusive to one another, the two pair compositional group of seals and the inscriptions of royal officials often co-occur. The two pair group of seals is also the only one that does not include what Rakic refers to as the linear style of carving. And it is therefore often illustrated when discussing so-called classic Akkadian seal carving with deeply carved intaglio that forms high relief when impressed. Other non-contest seals occur, scenes occur on seals of the royal corpus, but they are also distinguished by the shared emphasis on detailed musculature. The highly modeled muscular bodies of the figures found on the two pair contest scenes can be closely linked to the official royal state apparatus and thus to the king himself through their socio political context of ownership and use, as well as to royal monumental art through the formal similarities. Coupled with the notable volumetric rendering of animate bodies on Akkadian monuments and seals is an expansion of empty space surrounding the figures. This characteristic is most evident in the contest scenes on seals, which develop out of the complex intertwined and patterned examples from the early dynastic period, an example of which you see here on the bottom. In the Akkadian period, the contestants separate into distinct groups 
both the figures engaged in combat and the individual contest groups are separated uh, from one another with almost no overlapping. This spatial separation is also evident in large scale monuments, most notably on a steely fragment from Tello that has been attributed to the second Akkadian king, Rimush. The fragment preserves a side edge of a flat round top steely carved on both sides, and you're seeing the two sides here. Organized into registers, three of which partially survive, the steely depicts a series of combat scenes. The surface of the limestone steely has been cut back deeply, most evident in the dividing lines between the registers. This allows the bodies to be carved in high relief, visibly pronounced in the naked enemies, but also evident in the modeling of the human musculature underneath the garments seen on the Akkadian soldiers. Like the contest scenes on cylinder seals, the combat separate into pairs that are evenly distributed across the surface of the registers with minimal overlapping occurring only in the instances of prone enemies whose bent knees lie behind the upright bodies of their Akkadian aggressors. What we see in these attentions to the body are a volumetric occupation of space through the built up forms of planes or high rounded relief. Figures exude a concrete presence as they literally occupy space in front of or above the surface of their backgrounds. They do not, however, occupy space in a coherently illusionistic manner. They maintain a so-called twisted perspective with profile head and lower body and a front torso. Interactions between figures are formulaic and repetitive, rarely engaging in complex bodily poses or gestures. This holds true even on the Naram Sin stele from Susa, held up as an exemplar of unified spatial composition. Each Akkadian soldier occupies his own space and assumes an identical posture, facing to the right with left foot stepping up, frontal chest with left arm bent in front of the torso and right arm extended behind it, effectively echoing Naram Sin's posture at the top. The enemy takes more varied poses, but except for the two dead enemies on which Naram Sin stands that overlap one another, each also occupies its own spatial area and assumes stereotyped gestures. Interaction among figures is implied rather than depicted, and the famed landscape elements of the mountain, trees, and undulating ground line act more as signs of a specific location than as spatial setting. Our desire to see and our ingrained habits of visual perspectivism have caused us to see more spatial unity than is actually depicted on Naram Sin Steely and in Akkadian art as a whole. In addition to musculature, scholars have pointed to the rendering of fabrics as evidence of naturalistic tendencies in Akkadian art. However, certain elements of textiles receive attention with respect to their supposed naturalism while other elements are treated more abstractly. And this variation is meaningful in terms of the specific aspect of textile materiality. These materialities are evident in three specific areas, suppleness of folds, transparency of fabric, and ornamentation of tassels. And I would suggest that the centrality of textiles in the Mesopotamian economy and larger cultural realm, and their association with wealth and personhood acted as a concrete means to make present the Akkadian king's royal contributions. Most notable among these is the rendering of the area of the robe along the thigh, a feature that appears on the royal figure in three-dimensional statues of Manish Tushu and on the Susa stele of Naram Sin. The best example is seen on the standing figure bearing an inscription of Shutruk Nahunta that identifies it as a statue of Manish Tushu looted from the capital of Agade that you see here. The hard dark stone sculpted into a cone shaped skirt exhibits a series of diagonal ridges that emanate from the upper left side of the skirt where the wrapped fabric tucks under the rolled waistband. These diagonal ridges fan out gently across the front of the skirt dispersing into the flat taut fabric. They are further softened and modulated by a second series of shorter raised diagonals that diverge slightly from the primary diagonals, producing a rippling effect. 
the wide bulky waistband depicts similar softly rounded ridges that project beyond the surface of the skirt. These modeled effects contrast with the taut execution of the slightly fair flaring skirt elsewhere, particularly evident when viewed from the right back side. They contrast also with the sharply defined diagonal line of the edge of the wrapped fabric, which is ornamented with small tassels along the bottom and larger ones on the left side. The left-hand tassels especially call attention to the contrast with their regimented angular crispness carefully arranged in a row. The tactile effect of rippling fabric is heightened by the highly polished dark stone, a material that is closely associated with the Akkadian period and which Manish Tushu boasts of obtaining after a series of conquests from the mountains across the lower sea, generally identified with the present day country of Oman. To some extent, the glossy polished stone itself contributes to its very haptic quality of soft rippling fabric, despite the hardness of the material. Yet the materiality of fabric appears also in another statue, lacking an identifying inscription, but generally attributed to Manish Tushu, made from the much less durable and more, much duller material of limestone. Despite damage to the front of the monument from subsequent reuse, the same diagonal folds emanate from the left side of the belt where the wrapped fabric has been secured. Likewise, though not as fully preserved, the thickly rolled belt exhibits the same heaviness of fabric as seen in the diorite example. There appears thus to be an overarching interest in the rendering of the tactile, haptic, and material presence of the fabric of the garments in at least these two specific locations. Furthermore, in both examples, these areas of extreme tactility, what Gronovig and Frankfurt and others have referred to as concreteness and actuality, contrast with the taut, immobile, and geometric form of the skirt as a whole and its sharply enumerated tassel decorations. The depiction of tactile fabric remains in use in Naramson's Susa, evident in the folds that radiate either side of the softly uh, on Naramson's right hip that secures the diorite and limestone used in the round, the tactility of fabric is localized on the hip, accentuating the area of the thigh directly below the waistband. The remainder of Naramson's outfit, the kilt and possibly also a shirt, recedes from view, perhaps in part due to the eroded condition of the soft sandstone. Yet, when compared to the similar juxtaposition of supple folded fabric with the taut unmodulated stone surface of the rest of the skirt seen on Manish Tushu's diorite statue, that the rest of Naramson's kilt escapes attention may have been a characteristic of the relief from its inception. This observation brings me back to my initial contention that it is not just the execution of tactile materiality that distinguishes these Akkadian monuments but more specifically the highlighting of a particular feature of the textile's materiality, in this case, suppleness. The depiction of rippling supple folds on Akkadian monuments has been seen as an interest in depicting the human body beneath the fabric. And it may certainly have served as a partner to the depiction of musculature in highlighting the physicality of the human body. However, here too, our preconditioning to see more in Akkadian art than is actually there might be at work, a preconditioning based on the ingrained habits of viewing, based on a Western privileging of naturalism. Indeed, there is little indication of a body beneath the standing statue of Manish Tushu's skirt, and Naramsin's rounded body is visible not through any rendering of the tied knot, but through the transparency of the fabric of the kilt, and shirt that cling to the modeled forms of the buttock, thigh, and biceps. Another statue that has been attributed to the Akkadian period also depicts what appears to be transparency of fabric. Found without its head and base at the northern side of Ashur, the uninscribed diorite or perhaps basalt statue of a standing male figure has been compared with the statues of Manish Tushu excavated at Susa. The severed head was recovered in a later excavation, also at Ashur, making this one of the most complete Akkadian statues to survive. And you see the drawing of the head on the right. Um, and I should note, um, as 
some of you probably know that it is um, somewhat debated about whether this should be dated to the Akkadian period or later. I, I personally uh, think it is um, Akkadian, but we can talk about that later if anybody wants to. It is a remarkable piece, which in its state of almost complete preservation, exhibits both highly modeled musculature as seen in the reliefs and a materiality of the fabric. The long skirt is mostly smooth, although there is a hint of softly rippling folds along the left hip, as in the two incomplete examples from Susa. In addition, a shawl drawn over the left shoulder cradles the bent left arm. Its border is indicated through a lightly carved band that runs along the inner edge of the left arm and diagonally across the back to the right hip. The fabric itself, however, clings so closely to the bulging muscles of the shoulder and biceps as to disappear from view. On the back, the shoulder blades and spine have been rendered through modeled geometric forms of two raised circles and an indented vertical line. And here too, the fabric stretching diagonally across the back does not conceal the anatomy. In these royal statues and reliefs, we have a complex intersection of the mass of the human body and the virtuosity of exquisite fine textiles that are supple and gossamer thin. The rendering of the fabric can contribute to the emphasis of the human body as seen on the Ashur statue and elsewhere, but that is not its sole purpose. Rather, the very worth and value of the textiles as tactile material products is also at issue, which explains the depiction of supple folds without any indication of the human body beneath, and the elaborateness of woven tassels that hang in entirely unnaturalistic precision. The transparency of fabric seen on Naramsin's Susa stele and the Ashur statue accomplished both tasks at once making visible the presence of the human body and highlighting the exceptional quality of the donned textiles. Textiles had been a central product for Mesopotamia since the so-called fiber revolution of the fourth millennium BCE. And they've been credited with creating and sustaining the economic foundation of Mesopotamian urban society. They continued to play an essential role in the Akkadian state indicated by several administrative documents from the period that record gifts of textiles both to and from the central administration. Yet this ongoing economic significance does not explain why in the Akkadian period, their tactile and haptic qualities of suppleness and transparency were newly of interest in sculptural form. The Assyriologist Benjamin Foster has suggested that the Akkadian period witnessed new types of elite garments, including a new style of wraparound robe made of smooth fabric with elaborate tasseled fringes. Pointing specifically to the tassels, he proposes that the introduction of the new garment was a result of the Akkadian conquest in Southwestern Iran. In her 2019 book, Melissa Eppeheimer builds on this idea to suggest that the elaborate fringes as an identifying marker of the Akkadian elite were picked up and adapted by later rulers as a means of associating themselves with the earlier Akkadian state. Indeed, the tassels seen on Akkadian statues are the earliest of their kind, although they become a standard feature of garments worn by figures of authority subsequently. Fringes and tassels also appear to receive highlighting by added paint. The current head of the department at the Louvre, Ariane Thomas, reports on findings from examination of Akkadian statue fragments in the collection, of them you're seeing a, a selection here on the screen, that were conducted by binocular loop and ultraviolet light, and that reveal possible traces of red, green, and yellow on the fringes, tassels, and hem ornamentation of both seated and standing Manish Tushu statues. Although it is not known whether the garments as a whole were painted, the traces of the fringes and tassels suggest that they were especially singled out through vibrant color. Fringes and tassels call attention to and act as an extension of the body. And we know that the impression of an individual's hem acquired the legal force of that person's identity, suggesting that a garment's edge could be equated with personhood. While the material expression of textiles may therefore signal straightforward associations with conquest and control, as a partible element of personhood, 
clothing could be seen to physically constitute the body. Representationally, during the Akkadian period, clothing does this ne not necessarily, or not only, through its definition of the body underneath it, but more fundamentally, as another essential element of the body itself. A garment's physical presence, its concreteness and actuality, thus serves to further actualize the personhood of the king. Because of the entwinement of body and clothing, the need to make physically present, that is to concretize, the king's body requi requires a simultaneously need to make physically present his clothing. The interest in physical presencing evident in the depiction of anatomy and textile also emerges from the very material support of the monuments in question. The large majority of royal sculpture in the round is made of dark, hard, igneous stones, usually identified as diorite, which were obtained from distant areas such as Oman. Manish Tushu's so-called standard inscription includes a reference to the acquisition of black stone from areas that he claims to have conquered across the lower sea, that is the Gulf, as well as noting the use of the stone to fabricate a statue of himself dedicated to the god Enlil. Moreover, this standard inscription was placed directly on statues made of dark stone, fragments of which have been excavated at Susa, Nippur, and Sippar. The use of a stone that is explicitly said to have been acquired through the direct result of military conquest may operate in a similar manner as Foster proposes that the textiles point to Akkadian conquest in Iran. Likewise, Irene Winter has argued that Naramsin's victory stele, found at Susa, originally erected at Sippar and depicting the conquest of peoples from the Zagros Mountains, is made from the very rock that constituted the conquered landscape. Steely fragments of a lustrous yellow-green alabaster have been recovered from Susa, where they may have been part of the same booty of Shutruk Nahunta, at Eridu, and in the region of Nasaria in southern Mesopotamia. The term alabaster is routinely used to describe a wide variety of light-colored stones, including gypsums and calcites, but those from Eridu in the British Museum have been sourced more specifically as calcite. Southern Mesopotamia, which lacks most stone resources, does have limited sources of gypsum and limestone, and the majority of stone works from the preceding early dynastic period are made from these instead of calcites. The calcite stones used for the steely fragments may therefore represent a non-local material brought to the south in a similar manner as the Naramsin Susa steely. Like the diorite stone, they boast a luster that appears to emanate from within when their surfaces are polished, enhancing their tactile appeal. Material is here more than simply the support for content. It fully participates in making a concrete presence of royal authority. Based on formal analysis, Pierre Amier, the former curator at the Louvre, proposed that Acadian royal monuments were carved as series in centralized workshops, separate specimen of which were then distributed around the realm. In a similar manner, Eppeheimer assembles evidence of Manish Tushu distributing his statues at cities throughout the state. Zettler also proposes a centralized production model for the official royal seals that feature some of the highest quality of carving. The evidence thus suggests that centralized royal oversight existed for the production of most large-scale monumental works in stone and metal, as well as for a subset of glyptic, and it therefore appears reasonable to seek motivations for the highly distinctive character of Akkadian art within royal concerns. Furthermore, if we acknowledge that pursuit of naturalistic rendering, that is, illusionistic imitation of perception, was not a principal driver, as indicated by the co-occurrence of elements that might be understood as both naturalistic and non-naturalistic, as well as by the absence of interest shown in relating figures and elements with one another in Euclidean space, then we should turn to the royal milieu to look for alternative motivations. Certainly, the Akkadian period instituted significant changes at the state level in all aspects of society, 
from the religious realm to the economic and political. Many of these changes documented have been considered the result of the unprecedented unification of the city-states of Sumer and Akkad under the Akkadian kings, although the trend towards expanding territorial states was already taking place in the final part of the preceding early dynastic period. While this explanation may be overly simplistic, it appears valid in its basic contours. In addition to establishing a new ruling dynasty based in a city, Agade, an act that was in line with the political structures of the early dynastic period, Sargon consolidated power over numerous other cities beyond what had been achieved by any of his early dynastic predecessors. Lugal Zagethe, the king of Uruk, had already begun a process of territorial expansion in the south, and with his defeat, Sargon expanded to control all of southern Mesopotamia, including both Sumer in the far south and Akkad further north in central Mesopotamia. The validity and accuracy of claims by Sargon and his successors to military control beyond southern Mesopotamia in Elam, Syria, Anatolia, and the Gulf remain debated among scholars, and I'm not going to tackle that question here. Nonetheless, in order to administer the new territorial state, the Akkadian kings instituted centralizing strategies, developing a series of reforms over the course of the dynasty. These are especially well documented for the later reigns of Naram Sin and his successor, Shar Kali Shari. There remains an academic debate regarding whether the Akkadian state qualifies for the designation of empire, although the arguments typically devolve around how to define empire and questions of how to interpret the relatively scanty evidence from the period. Yet the distinctiveness, the uniqueness and newness of the Akkadian state was impressed in the memories of later Mesopotamians as also in our own reconstructions. The distinctiveness of centralized rule, territorial expansion, standardized administrative and economic policies is both paralleled by and more importantly, given visual and physical form in the rendering of volume and mass, the presencing of a physical actuality in the royal arts. This is not an entirely new hypothesis. Even while enveloped in a narrative of the primacy of naturalism, the concreteness of Akkadian art has been linked directly to the consolidation of power in the singular figure of the ruler. Yet I think we can more precisely define the rationale undergirding the striking new artistic practices of the Akkadian period. I would call it the physical expression of a charisma of materiality. This charisma might be associated with the ancient concept of melam in Sumerian or melamu in Akkadian, as it is understood to be a physical emanation of awesome radiance. The association, however, is not straightforward even though an intriguing possible connection with the materiality of textiles emerges. The terms melam and melamu do not appear in any surviving Akkadian period text, although they appear both earlier and later. Thus, it is difficult to correlate the concept with the new materiality of artistic production that appears during the Akkadian period. Vladimir Emilianov proposes an etymology of the Sumerian term melam, that relates it to the Sumerian name for ritual garments, uh, Tugniglam. The word appears only after the Akkadian period, although it is suggestive that in Shulgi A, the king donned such a garment over his hips, bringing to mind the visual focus of the supple folds at the hips of both Manish Tushus and Naram Sin sculptors. Emilianov proposes an underlying conceptual connection between how clothing covers a body and how melam covered entities. Elena Kassan likewise connects divine garments to radiance, and even in the case of the associated term peluktu, to a kind of personhood or vital life force. It may be a stretch to tie this back to the new materiality of fabric seen in Akkadian sculpture, but it is suggestive. As Winter has proposed, one might view the luster of the polished stones as a material expression of melamu, which was understood to be a concrete entity, even as it was divine and radiant. However, one is still faced with the need to explain why this particular manner of expression 
emerged at this time, just as was the case with the emphasis on the materiality of textile discussed earlier. Instead of linking the materiality of Akkadian royal art solely with the concept of melam, melamu, I suggest that during the Akkadian period, a very specific and new kind of charisma emerged from the artistic material and the practices of the centralizing state. This was a charisma that owed its power to the referencing of specific physical entities, bodies and textiles that bore particular value in Mesopotamia. It was a charisma that owed its power to the presencing of these entities in durable, immutable materials like diorite and the skills required to create them. And it was a charisma that owed its power to those very materials themselves, glossy, lustrous, gleaming stones acquired from afar. Moreover, I would argue that we can ascribe the later prominence of the memory of Akkadian rulers in large part to the efficacy of these royal monuments. In 1993, Pyotr Mikulowski cautioned against naively accepting as fact the propaganda of the Akkadian kings and the subsequent mythology of their dynasty. In particular, he warned against ascribing firstness to several aspects of the Akkadian state, especially those of charismatic kingship and empire, noting that this privileging stems from the unevenness of the surviving evidence that showcases Akkadian royal power. However, without entering into the debate about origins, I would submit that it is precisely the surviving evidence that generated the charisma long associated with the Akkadian rulers. In other words, the evidence, monuments, seals, royal inscriptions, was not a reflection of some inherent essence of charisma that the Akkadian kings just happened to possess, whereas their predecessors did not, but rather these things, these items constructed from materials having volume, mass, shape, and visual affect generated a charisma that enveloped the Akkadian kings and projected their memory into the future. Thank you.